Hi there and welcome to the next episode of Skyship Stories. In this episode, our expert Skyship pilot Rod Burgess explains what life was like on the road with an airship and what it was like taking an airship on tour. So sit back, fasten your seatbelts as we vector the engines, push full power and up ship. Welcome to episode two of Skyship Stories. Absolutely. So when you started your, so you, you get qualified, or sorry, you got qualified. And what was your, shall we say, your first flight like? Well, um, after we'd taken the exams, mm -hmm. we were shipped off immediately to Weeksville, North Carolina, which was one of the old United States Navy blimp bases uh, from World War II and on into the 50s. Um, and the weather there in March is already getting pretty hot. Uh, and it's a small town. Elizabeth City is the, is the nearest town. It's a small town. And the, the local Holiday Inn was Airship Industry Central. They had, I don't know, maybe 60 rooms and about 35 of them were Airship Industries people. Gosh. We were the biggest employer in town. Mm -hmm. and. Everybody in town was great. They they sort of um, they adopted us. You know, we were the weird Brits who did strange yeah. things down the road at that big hangar. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the the flying area at Cardington is mm -hmm. a great big open grass field. Yeah. The flying field at Weeksville is a white concrete apron a huge great white concrete apron and there are two well there were then two hangars at mm -hmm. 90 degrees to each other um pointing out onto this enormous expanse of weed ridden old white concrete now you can imagine when the sun really gets to work on that yeah you could just about get snow blind walking across it and yeah. the heat from it was amazing how anybody th thought that that was a good way to fly airships, I can't imagine, because there were thermals all over the shop. <laughs> yeah, golly. So um, before we could start training in earnest, um, we were going to be flying Sierra Kilo, Sierra Alpha, which is uh, 502, sorry, mm -hmm. 503. Um, and she was engaged to go to Atlanta to take part in the centenary parade for Coca-Cola, who are based in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Now, when you take the ship on the road, it's a big operation. Um, you've got two pilots flying the thing. You've got at least 11 ground crewmen plus a crew chief. You've got an engineer, you've got an electrician. You may well have some wives and girlfriends, some hangers on. You've got seven vehicles. It's, a, it's quite a major operation mm. and it was, um, it wasn't quite achievable in one day, so it was a two hops to get to Atlanta. There were four of us, so two of the guys got a flight on the way out. Mm -hmm. They did the parade, and a couple of days later, we flew back to um, Weeksville. And I was fourth in line, so I my first flight properly at controls was from Florence, South Carolina, back to Weeksville. Um, and if I look at my logbook, it was 8.1 hours, which is a bit of a culture shock after flying little puddle jumping club aeroplanes for, you know, sort of 50 minutes at a time. Yeah. Um, and it's hot. It's, mm. you know, late springtime, early summer in Georgia and Carolinas. Yeah. yeah. So when it's hot, you've got a lower pressure height because the helium has expanded even when you're on the ground before you do anything. Yeah. Generally speaking, in order to get enough lift, you've got relatively low ballonet fill when it's hot, mm -hmm. which means that you've got a relatively low pressure height. Um, for a lot of the time anyway, the purpose of the airship was to be seen. Yes. So we'd what be at low what were you advertising at the time or who had the... Um, we actually had Coca-Cola on the okay. site for that. Mm -hmm. There's a surprise. Huge. Yeah. And the way the advertising was done um, is that you have a rectangle of patches 
glued onto the side of the ship with D rings, a huge great rectangle, the size of a tennis court. Mm -hmm. And the guys in the hangar lay out a large piece of lightweight fabric and they paint the design on it. Then that is hoisted up to the side of the ship and laced to the side of the ship. So most of the advertising wasn't painted on at all. It was these cloth banners stretched tight along the side. And if you look at some photographs of the ship in flight, you can see that they ripple. Yes. Exactly the way that the R100 skin rippled. And, yeah. Um, there were term contracts where they'd paint the ship, but we had Coca-Cola banners on the side of the ship for this flight. Uh, and so we flew our 8.1 hours at low level and because you never want to be too far from the ground crew you don't do what an aeroplane does and draw a straight line mm -hmm. you follow the freeway or the roads yeah and the convoy drives on the roads and you're not always in sight but you're quite often actually visible to each other you're certainly in radio contact at all times and you always keep the ground crew downwind of you just in case disaster strikes and you need to land quickly yeah um so cross country is is quite interesting you you can either um have to circle every little town you pass if there's a tailwind and you're going faster than the ground crew while well, they desperately try and catch up or if there's a headwind you're only doing 30 knots in the cruise. If there's a 20 knot wind, it takes you a long time to go yes. anywhere. Yeah. So the ground crews stop at every motorway service area and fill themselves with uh, burgers <laughs> and chips. And, <laughs> and then it? you radio them and say, OK, we've passed the next one. And they leapfrog up to you the whole time. I think that's so just we just flew really... across. Flat country, mostly, mm -hmm. and it was heavily wooded. Uh, and by British standards, sparsely populated. But the thing I, one thing I, two things I remember of that flight. One is that some joker took a pot shot at us in the backwoods. Oh, really? Some redneck <laughs> had fired at us, presumably with a rifle, mm -hmm. and we didn't even know it. People say, ah, but what if it gets a hole in it? You know, or a blimp yeah. is that we found out after 8.1 hours flying when the engineer stuck his head up into the, the observation dome and looked around the envelope and there were two little white spots of light God. where the yeah. bullet had come in and the bullet had gone out. <laughs> we were completely unable to tell from the instrumentation, the pressure difference yeah. between inside and outside is so low that, you know, it was a big non-event. Yeah, It wouldn't have been if he'd hit us or if he'd hit the fuel lines or something, but um, that was the one thing I remember. The other was that the for exposure flights, generally there were no seats or anything. The cabin was stripped out. Right. And in one corner was a chemical toilet, the same <laughs> as your mum and dad had in the old caravan yeah. that used to live beside, behind the garage. You know? yeah. And the rule was, if you filled it, you emptied it. <laughs> <laughs> so I went 8.1 hours with my eyes crossed, not even daring to go and have a pee because I was blown <laughs> I was going to empty the thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh! I didn't do that again. I can tell you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's fascinating because you, you always get this impression that you know everything is almost um, you know you see the airship from the ground, it flies past. You know the fact that you've got all of this logistics team that you're trying to manage as well. You know, I, I I don't know why I was under the impression that yeah you you know maybe you had a home base and you flew round and then you just flew back and the crew would be there. But of course, if you're going from point to point. You've got to get your experienced people ahead of you. Yeah, well, not necessarily ahead of you. You may have to keep them behind you. Yes, yes, <laughs> true. Yeah. yeah, it's it is. It's like three dimensional chess. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, another problem with cross countries is that uh, if you need to land, you can only safely land where there is a ground crew. Right. In yeah. emergency, you can put it down in the field. Mm -hmm. But without a ground crew and a mast, it will then blow away. So yeah. if you had to land in an emergency and there is no ground crew, you have to pull the rip handle and throw the helium away and the whole thing collapses in a heap Gosh. in the corner of the field. Yeah. So um, the convoy included, of course, a truck 
with a thing like a crane jib. It was actually designed for putting in telephone poles. It was, okay. uh, and we got that, painted it red and white, and put a fitting on the top to moor the ship to. So that was your mobile mooring mast. But just in case, our fuel truck, which was a big pickup truck, had um, a backup mast, which took about 30 minutes to bolt together. But the lads got very, very good at it. And we could rig that just in case there was a problem with the main mast. Mm -hmm. um, so the technical vehicles in the convoy were the mast truck, the fuel truck. We had to refuel from our own vehicle. Wherever you go, when you put the ship on the mast, people come and have a look. Yeah. They don't seem to appreciate that the thing can swing through 360 degrees. Yeah. So, you know, the airport security guys come and they try and pull into the swing circle in their pickup to come out and say hello. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. have to run over and say, oh, 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 oh would you mind backing yeah. off just a little bit, please? <laughs> Same with the fuel truck. So we had our own fuel truck, which was a, a low profile pickup truck that we could put underneath the ship. Right, got it. Um, and that had a roof rack on which we had this backup mast. So you've got the main mast truck, you've got the fuel truck, you've got an engineering van um, full of tools and equipment to look after the ship when it's on the road. Because, I mean, the big deal was the Fuji contract. The mm -hmm. Fuji ship would go off on tour and might be away for six months in one go on the road. Different hotel every night, right. different town every few days. Yeah. Um, you took everything with you. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the technical vehicles, you had a couple of um, big minibuses full of people. And then you had a Jeep at the front and a Jeep at the back, because when you went on the road, you took four pilots, at least two captains and two co-pilots. Sometimes it was more captains, but you had to have at least two captains mm -hmm. because the thing is actually quite physically tiring to fly. So, um, and, and some of the operations, when we were doing passenger flights over a city, for example, you'd have a morning shift and an afternoon shift. You couldn't do 10 hours of it in a day. Mm -hmm. So when you were on a cross country, the other captain takes the lead Jeep and the other co-pilot takes the tail end Jeep acts like a sheepdog and makes sure that everybody turned left at the traffic lights, you know, right. nobody's off to Philadelphia by accident. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh. So this convoy of seven vehicles went everywhere. Um, and because we were away for so long, they made this rule that, you know, the old wife and girlfriend could go on sufferance, um, <laughs> which was great. Uh, you yeah. know, it's most unusual to take your wife to work day permanently. <laughs> How long was the, so what was it, was there a limitation of how many hours you could fly? Yeah, we were, um, what we were doing was generally what the CIA calls aerial work. And I should mm. point out that wherever we were, the ships were British registered. It was only later that um, a couple of ships were registered in Japan, a couple mm. of ships were registered in Australia. Yeah. Um, all of the ships, even the one owned by an American casino company, were British registered. Uh, so we had to obey British rules. But of course, we were in the States for a lot of this. So we had to obey American rules as well, whichever was stricter. Mm -hmm. um, so we all the limit laid down by the CAA, including our duty hours. So what we were doing was called aerial work. There are two kinds of commercial flying. Aerial work is things like crop spraying or survey. No passengers are involved. No public freight is involved. Or there is public transport. Now, when we were flying passengers, we operated under public transport rules. When we were doing aerial work, the rules are sometimes a bit less strict. Uh, but we always obeyed the CAA limits on duty hours. So we had to have one day off in seven, absolute minimum and this kind of thing. Um, and there are limits on the number of hours you can do. But in actual mm -hmm. fact, that was never a problem. Um, 
because we'd have two crews on an operation, you never reach the monthly limits and the daily limits. Uh, you know, later in life, mm. I'd fly to Vancouver on, on a 767, which is 11 and a half hours. Mm -hmm. So my longest airship flight was a bit less than that. So we weren't limited by it, um, mm. although it did mean that occasionally you had to have a day off somewhere nice. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> it's funny because, um, you know, when, we, you know, you said you just did, you know, your first flight was an eight hour flight. Now I've got to go uh, on a flight um, in a few weeks time, which is going to be an eight hour flight. And you don't think about the pilot or, you know, you think it's a, a short haul. We were so used to taking short haul, you know, three hours, two hours and things like that. You don't think that, of course, because it's slower, that you're going to be at the controls and you're going to be really having to be focused you know for that, those eight hours yeah that's right i mean in in airline flying you know later in life when i flew airliners you plug the autopilot in so the mm -hmm. airplane is doing the work you're doing all the mental work the airship wasn't like that it has an autopilot mm -hmm. and it had no powered controls and the control surfaces are immense they are yes. absolutely huge uh and they're hard work they are very hard work. And whereas an aeroplane pilot is making little tiny corrections, half an inch mm -hmm. here, an inch there maybe, with the airship, you are sawing away. You may well go from full nose down with the yeah. veins in your neck standing out to, whoa, full nose up with the veins in your neck standing out <laughs> and left and right the same. So although theoretically the ship could be flown by one pilot, it was deemed to be a two crew operation and right. you didn't change seats, but you would do an hour mm -hmm. and then you'd swap and he'd fly for an hour and you would do the navigation log and work the radio and all that kind of thing. Nice. Um, if it was bad, if it was turbulent or mm -hmm. gusty, you might only manage a quarter of an hour. Wow. And when it was his turn, you, sh you shut yeah. your seat and <laughs> drained. Yeah. Golly, yes. Those things are so, sort of things that you really don't, you know, because of the differences between sort of heavier air and lighter than air flying yeah. and the conditions that you're flying in. Yeah. And, and of course, um, constant vigilance because you constantly got to be aware of the envelope pressure, mm -hmm. pressure in the ballonets, the trim of the ship. Um, yeah. And whereas an airliner, things change a little bit as the fuel gets burned off. In the airship, you fly out from under a cloud, the helium gets warm, everything changes. Yeah. So you're constantly aware of what's going on around you uh, and having to make adjustments for it. Yeah. Golly. Yeah. And it, it, I mean, we, we mentioned it's like a boat. Um, the motion is a lot like a boat. It, it rolls and rocks gently like a boat on a rolling, not in a rough sea, on a rolling sea. Mm -hmm. um, to the point where, as soon as we levelled off after takeoff on passenger flights, everybody could undo their seatbelts and wander around and have a look. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somebody would, would yell, oh, look at this over here. And everybody would rush over to the left hand side to those yeah. windows. And then somebody would shout the same thing from the right hand side and everybody should. And they'd, uh, they'd wander up and lean over your shoulder and have a chat while you were flying. Um, they could walk around perfectly safely. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, in the days of the great big rigids, oh, yeah. though they moved around, mm -hmm. they moved around very gently and sedately. And the number of occasions on which crockery slipped off a table or something yeah. are, are very few. Yeah, almost non-existent. Yeah, yeah, almost non-existent, exactly. Mm. Um, so 8.1 hours was probably a little bit more than average flight, but, but routinely we'd be airborne for six hours or so. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were advertising over a city, yeah, you just wander around at 1500 feet over the city for six, seven hours. Um, just letting people read the name on the side. Yeah. You know? Again, we thank Rod for his amazing insights. So join us next time for Skyship Stories Episode 3, where Rod talks about the most amazing sights over New York, which was the Great Blimp Race. So until next time, keep vectoring those engines. <laughs>